thanks so much for joining us. Um, you know, I think that the topics of AI, regulation, national security are, are sort of the, the topics of the moment. Um, maybe to start with, I'd love to hear both of your views on, you know, how you think the current state of artificial intelligence and its development intersects with national security and sort of the, you know, kind of what we we're all talking about, the how it intersects with the geopolitical um, challenges that we face as a nation. First of all, thank you for doing this. It, it is very important that we not take a pause. Um, AI has already been integrated into the defense of many countries, not just our own. It's offensively being used. A best example I can give you is one that you can all go back and read about. The Nagorno-Karabakh war between Armenia and Azerbaijan occurred in uh, September of 2020. Uh, Azerbaijanians actually used AI with loitering munitions that they purchased from Israel and did so in, in, in a devastating way. Uh, they had loitering munitions that literally once a kill box had been identified, no human in the loop anymore. And they simply went into this area, identified every type of a target, and then the munitions basically communicated among themselves and identified which target needed what type of munition and which one of the drones was going to take it out. And they did it autonomously. That's for real. And these are two small countries that you never would have thought of as being a part of something as complicated and using AI to destroy their enemies. It's here. It's not going away. The challenge for us is how do we take the most important parts of the capabilities that we have in the United States, which is the private side being able to actually participate in defense contracts and to utilize all of the talents that are out there as quickly as possible while still protecting the privacy that our system demands that we provide. Mark? Well, first of all, let me also thank you, Alex. And Mike has uh, been a great member of the Armed Services Committee for a long time. He's a new member on, on the Intelligence Committee. And I use that title to ask a lot of really dumb questions. Right now, and not. And, but this is an area that we are, are um, going deep into. You know, I think uh, over the last few years, I think we've started to understand that we need a new definition of national security. It's not who has simply the most tanks and guns and ships and planes. It is who is going to win the contest around AI, who is going to dominate next generation wireless 5G, who's going to take the, the lead in synthetic biology. Uh, we had Mike and I participated in the modular nuclear um, uh, call together recently. And, and all of these areas were in a technology competition with the PRC. And I think it's really important and I know I've talked with, with Mike about this, that we make clear when we say our beef is with, the, with China, that we make clear our beef is with the CCP and Xi Jinping and not the Chinese people and not the Chinese diaspora. Because otherwise, not only are you not trying to be politically correct, but you frankly play in to the CCP's propaganda machine if you don't make that clear, number one. Um, on AI, and you know, Alex came recently, we, we convened a group of all the intelligence community leadership and Alex and a couple of other leaders were willing to participate. And I think it was a really good discussion, but it, but it also makes me kind of uh, pull back a little bit. And, and let me echo what both Mike and Mike have said is, you know, there's no ability to call a timeout and a pause. I mean, this race has started. Um, but even within the intelligence community leadership, you, I kind of, I've been doing this stuff long enough, but I feel like to a certain degree, AI has become the buzzword of what cyber was maybe 15 or 20 years ago, where everybody on a government program says, I'm gonna add this buzz term and see if I can get a little more money on whatever program I have. So, and I, I've been wrestling a lot with whether we should spend a lot of time trying to even get to common definitions. I'm not sure that's worth the effort, but I'd love to get input um, uh, coming from from scale and from from some uh, other experts in the field, whether we ought to start with, with, with common definitions. On the regulatory front, um, you know, China as one of our competitors has actually putting together a regulatory regime. The Europeans have put together a regulatory regime. You know, my huge fear is that if we somehow say as somebody who, well, with good friend Rafi Martin over here, we wrote the first uh, white paper on 
some of the challenges around social media in 2017. And having been a VC before I got into this business and invested in many of the social media companies 25 years ago, the idea that that old model of the late 90s of let us go out and break things and come, we'll figure out later how to put guardrails, that would be a disaster if we said, you know, don't put some, some guard rules around, um, uh, around this very, very powerful force. And uh, I think we have to acknowledge um, as we kind of are trying to learn. And that's, what I think, what we're, one of the things we're all trying to work on is how we all get ourselves educated as, as quickly as possible. That there are, it appears to me at, at this point, certain things based in like hallucinations may not be a bug, but frankly, a feature of some of, how, some of the designs that have taken place. And if we can't figure that out on the front end, one of the things we did uh, over a month and a half ago was like, let's at least start with security. I mean, you know, data bias, some of the other uh, inherent huge big issues. How do you make sure that content originators uh, are at some point either get permission or get compensation so that their data as they go into these large language models are not simply absorbed. You no longer have any incentive to be a creator. Um, but we ought to, those will be more complex. But the notion of at least starting with security, how do we make sure um, on the large language models they are not easily penetrated, that the, the data inside cannot be manipulated. We're bringing in a, our, our next, we've done a series of these learning sessions with senators. Uh, uh, we're bringing in uh, more prominent Princeton professors, talks about how he has been able to, frankly, adding code that is not visibly written, alter some of the descriptions about his own personal um, characteristics, and then the product, the chat GBP spit out, spit out incorrect data. So how do we make sure that at least security component is put in place? So I think we've got a lot of work to go. The potential, I agree with what Mike is, is, um, is huge. I think I also agree with Mike Gallagher and he's a very, very smart and talented guy. I, I like working with him a lot that, you know, this competition, China is not going to slow down and they've almost got it. We think about the notion of we've got large language models here. We've got scale and others who kind of were the the guts of putting together the data sets. We've got the, you know, NVIDIA is another kind of making the the, the compute power to, to drive this whole process. I mean, China has created the similar with, you know, Alibaba, Badu, Tencent, with well, our old friend Wally playing the big piece. They've got a similar ecosystem, so we can't stop. Um, but I do think we need to get educated, and I do think we need at least a framework of how we ought to be thinking about this. As you can tell, Mark hasn't been thinking about this. <laughs> well, it, Senator Warner outlined some of the some of the major risks here. I think, in general, falling behind is is one large risk. Uh, the security uh, implications, and and um, uh, you know, I, I actually uh, thank you for sort of uh, addressing the question with all the leading AI companies because I think it is important that we all have uh, robust security practices. Um, Senator Rounds, what are some of the big risks that you see uh, for AI going forward? Number, number, number one uh, is if we decide that we're not going to have a process in place, and I'm going to look at it from a defensive purpose, from the Department of Defense in particular, if we don't have a process in place that we reform the way in which we acquire product, we're going to fall behind. Uh, we need to be able to access cutting edge technology from firms of all sizes. It's the one advantage that we have over uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party. This is the fact that we have a private sector which is very, very bright and is very, very capable of doing a cutting edge technology and doing it very efficiently. If we don't reform our system of how we acquire that and invite people to come in, then we're not going to take advantage of, the, of, of, of an opportunity that they don't have and we do have. Second piece on this, uh, we do need a regulatory environment, but the regulatory environment must be such that we provide the transparency that Mark talks about so that you know how these are logically being done. But the third piece is, is let's go back to the basics. Is if, if an action taken was wrong, uh, if it just an individual themselves had done it, simply because AI was involved that it doesn't make it right and it doesn't make someone unaccountable. And so you have to have that same accountability process built into the regulatory process or recognized by it when you talk about how you structure laws and regulations surrounding uh, AI itself. The other piece on this is, is that, that we have a tendency to over-classify everything we do. 
the, the Department of Defense put together and had a group of brilliant people actually look at what AI could do for the defense of our country. And they put out two reports. One was an unclassified report, which was very interesting, and it laid out how critical AI is to the long-term success of defending our country. But the second piece was a classified version, which the vast majority of the people that needed to see it couldn't see it because of the classification categories. But it did one more thing. It also offered opportunities for a quality of life improvement in this country that very few people would have guessed. And yet, in order to get it to the decision makers to implement the AI that's found within this report and the, and, and the capabilities that it has, if you don't know about it, and if you don't get it to the appropriators who don't have the classification capabilities to even learn about it, how in the world are you ever going to propose or uh, put together the, the, uh, the, the bids, the request for information to the, com to the com companies that are out there that have these capabilities in the first place. If you want to cure cancer, we can do it. And we can do it very quickly. But you'd better darn well invest the money now so that you're on the cutting edge of it and you're getting it done as quickly as possible. Every year we go by in which we don't appropriate the dollars in the right locations is one more year in which we don't solve these things. So it is a, a, the, the biggest risk we have. I'm going to come back to this and then I'll shut up. The biggest risk we have is in slowing down our ability to invest in AI capabilities from, from companies of all sizes that have that capability available now. And let me, uh, one thing Mike and I have worked together along with John Cornyn and Wayne Wyden, we're talking about an odd couple, um, you know, uh, is, is this notion of overclassification. And we've got kind of a skinny bill that's technical fixes. Then we got one that's out there that's that really would almost put a public interest test to every agency to say, is it in the public interest? Uh, the public interest need to know versus the the desire to have the government keep classified. That's a pretty edgy concept. CIA and other are flipping out a little bit on this, but I think this debate is way overdue. It's we've always known we've overclassified, but it's always been tomorrow's debate. But after Teixeira, after the presidential documents, and you've got a separate little kind of a no-brainer thing that says before you leave president or vice president, let's actually have somebody go through the boxes before the president or vice president just takes the stuff out. Um, but I, I agree with, with, with Mike on the, the overclassification. On the investment side, I, I'm still struggling with fears back. One of the first people that I, I read on this stuff was Kai Fu Lee. And remember, there was the whole notion on AI and the battle between China and the United States. And his basic premise, as you all know, was, you know, the entity that has the most data, the most compute, and the most number of pure engineers is going to win. And with the Orwellian surveillance state and the complete lack of, of uh, barrier between the quasi-private sector in China and the government, they got the most data. They got plenty of compute. And they can throw huge quantities of engineers. Now... Most people probably in this room have said that premise isn't really true anymore. But I also then think about not so much Alex's conversation with you, but with um, some of the large language model guys and gals at you know, end of last year who would always say, and with their large corporate sponsors, you know, the reason we are going to roll the field is because. Look at this huge amount of data processing we have. We have already absorbed, you know, all of the Library of Congress and all this knowledge. And the, the, the notional idea that he, the entity that has the most compute and the most data wins, people were saying that pre-Christmas holidays. It feels almost like what ChatGPT4, that people went a little surprised at how successful it's been. And there's now a little bit of hesitancy that says, well, maybe that's not the model, and we can have three or four large language models out there that can all compete with each other, and then we can bolt on these industry sectors and maybe different if we want. But I just, but one of the things I don't know if I buy that because I, you know, one of the questions I would have is, uh, assuming we want to make sure we've got all the ability to invest, um, and we would, we've got all the ability to try to mask this innovation against the challenge with China, why wouldn't it be in the national security interest of our country to 
force the open AI Microsoft and anthropic Google to actually merge together or throw in Amazon as well. But this, I, I, I don't, I think we're still sorting through. I say that somewhat provocatively. Uh, let me see if I can have people's heads explode here. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, I think at least I'm still at the stage of trying to sort through what type and what's, where do we get this? Let me, let me push back a little bit on one thing. The big guys are really important, but so are the little guys. And there is a huge amount of, of activity out there that we can't let go away. And, and that is, is in this country, we have lots of people here. And believe me, if, if I asked for a show of hands in here, I'll bet you if I said, how many of you really are looking forward to living in communist China? I don't think there's a whole lot of people that want to go and live in communist China in a police state. Now, they are really good at what they do. And in a police state, to have all that data on your people makes it a whole lot easier for the police state to exist and to continue on. But if you ask people around the world, not just in this room, where do you want to go to live? Where would you like to have? Where's your opportunity at? It's in America. It's here. Can you imagine what this world would be like if in 1933 Albert Einstein had not been allowed to immigrate into the United States? What are we doing today? Now, and I'm going to get a little bit on the edge here, but I'm just going to say this. If we really want to continue, we have got to allow those people who want to come here to come here. Amen. And we've got to be able to have a legal immigration system that recognizes the value to this country of those brilliant minds that are out there who simply want to come and to make this country better than what are now putting them in the witness protection program. Yeah. In yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but this is something that we have to talk about. And, and once again, I go back. Why wouldn't we want the brightest minds in the world to be able to come here and to do this? And why wouldn't we open this up and make it such that we there are welcome and that their ideas, even a small startup, still has the possibility of doing great things, even if they're only 17 years old or 18 years old or 19 years old. But that's what we need to be able to look at. Is And this is something China does not have and they won't have in a police state. I concur again, but I also go, goes back to the, and that says all of the applications that are going to, I think, still bolt on to the large language model, even if you're marginally better against this kind of potentially monolithic Chinese model, even if the improvement was only X percent, I again say this more to stir the debate because I'm not sure I've reached the conclusion. Even if we got a 5% increase, if we could combine the compute power of Google and Microsoft and we combine the data sets that they both had, that would still not lessen the need for any of you startups here that can bolt on, you know, the chemical industry application or the, you know, the satellite NGA application. But I just wonder whether there is going to really be three or four large language model platforms or will there be a default to because a little bit of what we're talking about i think we're all seeing with china is if they win the race could their large language model underpinning become the default model that the world uses data labeling is is, 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 the, is, is the thing and i mean that's where this is going in a lot of ways but one of the three critical pieces we've got we've got the compute power and we're going to continue to push more compute power um to, to be able to have the algorithms that are there and they're, and they're out there and there's going to be more of them coming. But the data labeling, this is the truth in lending, so to speak. You have to make sure that that data labeling is correct and that you understand it. And if you're sharing it or you're taking it, you've got to know where you're getting that data from. And you've got to know whether or not it's been correctly labeled and is it going to work in the model now? Yeah, if, and the bigger you can get on that, that's one of the reasons why you know our, our adversaries in China are having a problem with a lot of different things is they have a limited data labeling capability because they're not over here. Now, TikTok is helping them because, you know, why in the world would you want TikTok? Because you're able to get a lot more data on the rest of the world. But nonetheless, data labeling is critical. It's a huge part of what we've got. And it's something that I think as the technicians in this move forward, they're going to be able to tell us how you make sure that in terms of transparency, but also in terms of the, 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 the accuracy of what you've got does everybody understand it when you share it from one platform to another? I, I don't know if that makes sense, but 
look, I'm, I'm still trying to get out of the third grade when we come to this stuff. But that's the one thing that I think is critical is, is it, the data that we've got out there, does everybody understand what it actually is? But do we, yeah. Leo, and do, do we owe an obligation, though, as we collect that data and label it correctly, to either get permission to use the data or from whoever, whoever sourced it, mm-hmm. or even further down the line, potentially even compensate the source of that data? And how do we get over what I'm still trying to figure out? What may be, I go back to the hallucination answer at the beginning, is, is it a is it a bug or a feature of some of these systems? You know, do some of the models actually end up trying to give you an answer to respond to the desires of the entity that's writing the query? And is that, you know, again, I'm still trying to wrap my head around some of this, but is that bias built in? Yeah. A bit, you know. We also the, the the thing that was supposed to be the Air Force, you know, rogue event that was actually just a thought a thought study that you know people flipped out and then realized, oh, never mind, never mind, it was all made up. But you know that conceptual notion that you you build a system that's supposed to have the human in there until the the AI tool says, well, you know, uh, the human's turning down too many times to take out the enemy, so we're gonna eliminate the human or then eliminate the the control time. That was all a thought experiment. It was not a a a reality by any means, but if there is this inherent desire from the, and you would know Alex a thousand times better than I, than I can I probably put together, for the the tool to try to please the response that the query maker wants, is that something we got to sort through as well? Right. I, I think we touched on a number of topics uh, that are all very important. Talent being a critical one. I think data is another one. I I agree. The importance of not only the importance of data and data labeling, but also, you know, we can't have walled gardens of data that prevent, you know, our data from being an asset for whether it's our private sector or or our or our government. Um, you know, we talked a lot about, I think, you know, in that conversation, strategies for the United States to maintain a lead, to be ahead, to 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 race forward. There's also a lot of, you know, to dive in on the on the regulation question. There's also a lot of fear around the technology. Um, you know, there's a writer strike happening right now in LA. Uh, one of the one of the big motivators of that is artificial intelligence and and job security. Um, so I'm curious. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Senator Rounds. How you would balance the sort of you know I think the 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 need for the United States to remain ahead on this technology with a lot of the the concerns that the public has around the, the technology. The, the, the concerns and, and 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 Mark's been a leader in this. The concerns are real. Um, n- n- number one. You can't, you should not get into those private areas at, at, and, and to disclose them. Just like you can't right now. Well, we're not supposed to be disclosing private information right now, not using artificial intelligence or machine learning. Why should it be that using machine learning, we can suddenly then disclose it or allow it to be disclosed? Well, at the same time, individuals are giving away huge amounts of their personal data every single day on social media. So how do you, how do you make it clear that that these tools have limitations on them, and how do you write that into legislation when you're gathering the data, and how do you allow that data to then be utilized in terms of of, of an appropriate database, and yet you don't allow it to be singular singularized out, so to speak. Um, the other piece on this, I think, is is the transparency is important. You need to be able to share how you get to a particular logical conclusion. The other piece on this that that uh, is important is is um, accountability, and, and by that, and this is my own term on it. But if a, if a student plagiarized something today, it's wrong, and everybody recognizes it as being wrong. Using AI, if it is being, if you are using AI, you are plagiarizing unless you disclose it. So I think you have to be able to publicly disclose what portion of your decision making process came out of an. AI engaged process. And I'll share one one item that I just thought was fascinating. And this goes back to what Mark said earlier about is there a bias which is built in? A chat GPT, um, Sam Altman was in, had breakfast with us. And when he was done, I went back to my office and I said to one of my younger people here who don't knows how to use computer systems better than I do, and I said, pull up this chat GPT. Let's ask it a question. And we asked it about a particular individual who used to work for us who had passed away. He had a, let's write a story because I was going to do a special message about this gentleman. And Chat GPT looked at it for a little while. I just wanted a 200 word essay about his life. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. I said, okay, that's okay. Well, let's try another one. 
there is an underground laboratory, the Sanford Lab at Homestake Mine in Leeds, South Dakota. We're looking for neutrinos. And it's one that's kind of been a pet project of mine since 2003. So I said, well, let's put something in there, a 200, 200 page or a 200 word summary of what's going on there. It comes back and it goes right down the line and it is accurate in the whole bit. And it ends with a quote from Jim Sawyer, who was the guy that we looked at earlier. During that time, less than 15 minutes, it had gone on out and done the searches and had found a quote from the guy that he couldn't find earlier. It was learning and it put it in, it was an accurate quote. But that was 15 minutes, it educated itself. That process is something that I think we have to recognize in terms of how it learns and who it's learning from, which is what Mark is saying. What about that bias? It knew that I was looking for a quote from, why didn't it take a quote from a, a scientist who was working there? Why did it take a quote from one of my former staff members who had worked with me on this project for years? That to me is part of what we have to talk about when we talk about accountability and how we get those ideas from, from the use of this, what used to be called machine learning, and but it got to be a lot more lucrative if you call it an artificial intelligence. Senator Ward, I know you you spent a bunch of time thinking about the the risks and yeah, I just I, I'm again I'm still at that stage of trying to learn as quickly and as much as I can, and I I I am wide open for business for anybody. I've got Malcolm and, and Rafi from my office here, and would love to help get educated. Yeah, let me give you an, another example because this is again where I'm. I don't know the answer here because it's it's like if we even try to say the source of the data. I sat with uh, one of the publisher in New York recently who was flipping out. I think he published both um, Food and Wine and Bon Appetit. <laughs> you know, and his question was, why would I spend another dime hiring anybody to write about better ways to do recipes on you know, baking chicken. If we can, if everybody's going to default to asking a large language model, you know, give me four examples on how I should bake my chicken. And we don't know whether that baked chicken recipe came from the Betty Crocker cookbook and the Julia Child cookbook that had already been absorbed or his cutting edge writer who we, she was out reviewing some cool new restaurant that had a new, like, so sourcing back that data piece and separating what's already been absorbed from the kind of inherent kind of sucking in of all the data versus new additions. I think that goes a little bit to your question about why did it take um, your query and add that as opposed to finding a science. That goes to the transparency issue. So I, I guess what I would say, Alex, is you know, data sourcing, permission versus payment, um, um, you know, responsibility within this, within the, the, why, you know, who is responsible? Somebody comes in and manipulates the ChatGPT4 answer. Is ChatGPT4 still responsible or not? Um, you know, that's where I would hope we could at least get common agreement on security. How do we make sure these models, um, you know, so, so we do learn the, language, the lesson from cyber where we have always come in and tried to fix with cyber solutions built in afterwards. How do we build in security on all these systems, you know, from day one is an area that I, I would at least use, I think we ought to make as a common starting point. And then as we kind of get into these much, much naughtier issues, you know, try to do it thoughtfully. And as you said, try not to, uh, you know, by any means stall innovation, but it would be, I think, a disaster. And I say, this is an old tech guy, an old telecom guy. If we did the same thing where, um, whether it's Section 230, whether it's privacy, whether it's kids' online safety, whether it's the fact of dark patterns, you know, manipulated behavior that social media uses, the fact that we have not passed anything. You know, there are many areas Congress gets a flunking grade, but we should be kicked out of school. And, and the fact that we've given it over to the Europeans or given it over to other entities or individual states, we lose that policy setting advantage. That's kind of been America's secret sauce because we not only innovate, but we then usually get to set the rules, the protocols, and the standards, and that adds value to our systems. And I hope we can, you know, the, the old walk and chew gum at the same time. But I'm, I'm, I'm really nervous about this. Yeah, you know, you brought up an interesting proposal earlier. I wanted to touch on um, some of the the, the meteor uh, questions, but you know, you brought up this this 
proposal around, hey, maybe we should merge our, our efforts within the United States to sort of provide, um, to build sort of the most uh, competitive and most uh, advanced AI initiative by sort of combining the compute resources, the talent, the data, et cetera. You know, I'm, I'm curious, um, uh, Senator Warner, for a bit more on that. Mostly, is it is that motivated by national security concerns? Is it motivated by um, sort of uh, how much does national security weigh in that decision? And what do you think? Are Look, the- it, I, I think about, I actually am not sure what I suggested, but I frankly, would, if you said to me today, would you do that? I'd say no. But I think it is. Well, you're thinking it, out loud. It is, no, it, but I want to provoke because all of us are saying, and I'm guilty of this too. Oh my gosh, if we don't move quickly, China's going to beat our butts. And why is China going to beat our butts? Because they are stealing intellectual property, because they have an Orwellian surveillance state that collects massive amounts of data. They have unlimited compute power. So the whole notion, to use a phrase that you have some familiarity with, scale is important. And if scale is important as a reason why we have to move quickly to compete with China, well, then why wouldn't scale be important here? I don't think that's you. I don't think, you know, and the, and the idea that we had multiple um, social media models that are slightly different slivers that have been dominant, um, you know, but if, if there is this underlying supercompute large language model that, again, you bolt everything on, at least I'd like to have that. I'd love to have smart, smarter people than me argue that right. one way or the other. Right. So you know, the one, one concern that I would have is, is an advantage that we have over China is we've got this really robust private sector. Um, we don't want to lose that. I agree. And so I, I agree that we've got to be big enough to handle exactly what you're talking about in terms of data collection and so forth. But we've also got to have uh, enough um, um, activity or energy that that the smaller firms and multiple firms can still compete and can still contribute. And I, I think if you said, okay, look, we've got the, the system, we're going to take these two major companies, we're going to build this and we're going to focus on this this one particular data set, within six months, they're ahead of us, if that's our data set. On the other hand, if we have lots of different organizations that are constantly upgrading and building, um, I, I think we can keep, I think we can keep the, um, the advantage that we have right now in our most advanced. Let, yeah. let me, let me, yeah. I mean, and again, I was a venture capitalist longer than a senator, so I'm on your side, or I'm on the side of small startups doing well. Yeah, we're just thinking a lot, but but uh, which is not a good thing to do. Of course, I'm going to be in this with section pro one from you here. You've already made the news that you're all for immigration, so you. Uh, yeah, but I, I need to live with it. I, it's, but the argument I made just you know, we didn't have three competing Manhattan projects during World Two. And when we created this, somebody who's made a, a, a time, I made, I, I eked out a living because we created the world's best telecommunication system, and then we broke it up a little bit to create competition. But we initially created the world's best base telecommunication system through a single entity, AT and T. And then, thank goodness, we decided we were going to have competing systems and wireless, so I could come in and build Nextel and deal with a lot of spectrum stuff. But we started with that that core system. I, I, I'm with you, Mike. I think the I- innovation component is our secret sauce. I think the, the policy piece is also our secret sauce. If we can get those standards right, the rest of the world would like to default with all of our flaws to our standards because our standards will be more transparent. They will be more respective of human rights. You know, this is nerdy, nerdy stuff, but it was one of the things we were able to push back finally with the rest of the world on, on 5G and Huawei. Uh, you know, when we proved the back doors and then we said, you know, you ought to continue to, uh, uh, you know, standards are part of, of, of your values. Um, but I at least think I'd like to have this debate that when you start with the, the, the notion of what is the underlying generative AI tool that's the large language model, do we really need, I, I believe we're going to always have, you know, I could I'll make the argument that most entrepreneurs would rather ha- maybe just have one large entity 
so that you could bolt your system on. In many ways, you know, that was the, the theory of the case for a while in the 2010s um, and early 2000s where, well, you know, the ability to take uh, social media apps to scale disappeared because your only exit was to Facebook or Google. But a lot of people made a lot of money on that. Do you remember those days, Alex? Will you remember <laughs> <when> you... <laughs> no, I think there's I think there's truth in, in both in both viewpoints here, right? I think A, we need to embrace the sort of underlying entrepreneuriality and and uh, sort of dynamic dynamicism of our ecosystem. But uh, you know, we're also competing against a very monolithic adversary. And you know, they have similar military fusion. They will centralize their efforts to a, to a large, um, to a huge extent uh, within within their country. And so, you know, there's and they they don't have the concern about private property rights that we knew over here. Yep. And one of the and, and I think Mike got on as it alluded to this on DoD and Mike Gallagher did it well. And, and this was a, we've talked about in the past. You know, if I look at it now from the Intel side, you if we think about our overhead. Capabilities, which have expanded dramatically, and uh, you know, you add in all the additional commercial overhead capabilities. You know, we have more pixels to look at than we can possibly absorb. If you think about our friends at the NSA and Singit, we have more volume of Singit than we can possibly even source through. You know, our human enterprises are pretty damn good. Um, saying it uh, we got a lot of thumb drives from a lot of different folks. Sorting through all that is a huge, huge issue. Um, you know, so one of the things, let me cut it up. When we think on the intelligence side or when, you know, when we then think about NRO and some of this ability even to do major atmospheric issues that from a national security concern, then you've got the whole DOD side of the house. You know, I do think all of that needs to be much better combined rather than having the duplicative stovepipes that our traditional military system has. And all of the efforts, I sat through more, you know, uh, AMA, um, Intel authorization markups years ago where everybody said, don't worry, sissy, we're going to make sure we have that, you know, single best practices AI center on the intel side of the house, we got, you know, in, when we had that session, you wouldn't even have common agreement on definition of what was what was AI and what was not within uh, our intel community. So how we, uh, once again, the labeling of data. Labeling, labeling of data, labeling of purpose, and, you know, is there, is it worthwhile you know, to, to, to even distinguish what is the difference between big data, ML, AI, generative AI, you know, it's just, you've got this litany of, of terminology that I think most of our policymakers, I mean, don't understand me. I didn't understand most of this three months ago. You know, that, that's one thing that we're, what we're trying to put together right now. And it, we're trying to combine and to put together a process where members of the United States Senate can actually come to a common understanding of just exactly what we mean when we talk about machine learning or AI what it really is in terms of its current state is what it looks like today. And we're trying to do this as a, as a group on a bipartisan basis uh, so that folks can bring in their ideas and can be a host for other parts of the industries to come to different members and to say, these are the concerns we've got. Because the one thing we can't let this do is become a partisan discussion. This has to be bipartisan in nature. And I think we've taken the first step. That last dinner we had all together, it was like, and I can assure you, I won't go into the names, but it went from, you know, some of the people that you would view as the furthest on the right on the Republican conference to the furthest on the left on the Democratic caucus. And to, to, to the good news point, there is no Democrat versus Republican position on AI at this point. And more we can keep, guys like you and I can keep learning on this together and asking these questions together, I think the country would be better situated. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, we could probably talk all day on this on this matter and uh, and a lot of very important topics that we. Could... You've exhausted both of us. This is all we know. <laughs>
Uh, but uh, but yeah, we, we can have... talk about TikTok though. I gotta. Yeah. I gotta... <laughs> we, we can't get started on that. So thank you so much, uh, Senator Round, Senator Warner. Uh, thanks so much for coming by, and uh, and what a what a vibrant. Thanks discussion. for doing. Thank you. Yeah. And just remember, it's not Democrats Republicans. It's House Senate, and Senate's always higher. <laughs> <laughs>